everyone, Josh here, and I'm sitting in one of my favorite places in the entire world, the Highline Park, which runs along the west side of Manhattan. Today we've got a whole wild collection of things for you, but first up, we head out to Fort Greene to see my old pal, Jim Morrison. You might recognize him from the first season of The Mole. He was one of the finalists. But he and his partner, Tony, have created a t-shirt line called Dangerous Breed and a whole line of political t-shirts. So let's take a look. So I'm here in Brooklyn at a super cool store called Nolan with artist, activist, and Renaissance man Jim Morrison, who is the co-creator and co-owner of a super cool t-shirt line called Dangerous Breed. Hey, Jim, how are you? What's up, Josh? Good to see you. How would you describe your t-shirts? I mean, I, I tend to describe them as ironic travel t-shirts, but I don't even know if that's correct. But when, I, when people ask me about them, how do you describe them to people? Well. It's difficult because some of them kind of defy explanation, which is, you know what they say, confusion is the first step to learning. Mm -hmm. And so a good political message is going to confuse people. Because if you have a political message that is so overt and conclusory, you know, Bush with a line through it, no blood for oil, you're basically preaching to someone, this is what I want you to think, period, full stop. And that doesn't really push the ball forward. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is confuse someone, make them think, so then that they are thinking about the issue. So when they look at a ski or act shirt, for example, they're like, what? And in their head, basically, they're thinking, what's wrong with this picture? Right. Which leads you to the concept of what's wrong with the larger picture of the issue, ski or act, or Afghanistan with a sailboat. What's wrong with this picture? And then you start to think about, geez, we've been there longer than the Soviets. And you start to think about all these important things, just from a t-shirt that's kind of gotten into someone's head that way. So tell us, um, how long have you been doing this now? We've been making t-shirts since, geez, um, probably 2001. Mm -hmm. I was out in Los Angeles at the time, and I was working at MTV doing a, a pilot for a show. And we were hanging around at, at my producer's house, and I just took a magic marker and screened, Jesus hates your SUV, <laughs> onto the t-shirt. And a friend of mine had a, had a friend who was a buyer at a really cool store called like Laura Urbanati or something, like a really high-end store on Sunset. And one of my first memories is bringing my shirts there and her going, let's take down this Martin Margiela and put up Jim's shirts. That's amazing. And that's how it started. And then from there, I mean, we were doing these Jesus Hate Your SUV shirts. And it was all about this kind of like emblazoned political message on top of vintage shirts. And it just became obvious Tony and I, who, who founded the company, wanted to transition it into actually having the political message implicit in the imagery. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Ski Iraq was born, which is probably our, our biggest, most famous t-shirt. You know, you talk about the political message. I mean, I think that that is such an essential ingredient in not only the t-shirts, but in who you are. And, and is it fair to say that, you know, there was a point where you used them as sort of a platform to begin discussions about things that were concerning you? I, I think I started the t-shirt company with Tony before I ran for office, which I know you're, you're kind of getting at. I, when I moved back from LA after getting frustrated with that whole thing, I was like, why make a TV show? I'm just going to go run for office. I mean, you know, I really put my money where my mouth is. And so I guess every aspect of me personally has been about kind of trying to broadcast some sort of thought provoking message, whether it's running for office in a Don Quixote like <laughs> quest in New Jersey or, or just you know, making t shirts that make people think. Do you, have, do you have any political aspirations? I would love to run for office again. I toyed with running for city council in New York. Um, it's hard because a, a, lo a lot of it is a turnoff. The political game can be a real turnoff, but it's also kind of a drug. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, having someone listening to what I'm saying or hanging on ev my every word on a political issue that I'm passionate about is a drug, and it's one of those good drugs. So it would be hard for me to say that I wouldn't want to run for office again because I definitely would. How do you choose like what message you're going to put out in, on, on your latest shirt? Well, I mean, the events kind of choose it for you. I mean, that's, that's fairly easy. And my background is in foreign policy, my education. Tony, my partner's background, is more in graphics and design. And so that's a really, good, a really good mesh. But choosing them isn't, isn't really hard. They just kind of come to me. I mean, the shirt that I'm screening right now, you know, is this walk like an Egyptian shirt with Tahrir Square on it. I mean, you know, it's fairly easy to, to choose that, you know? When you started back in 2000, 2001, 
Did you ever think a decade later you would be in this beautiful store in Fort Greene and just, you know, working yourself to the bone doing all sorts of t-shirts? It goes up and down. You know, there are times when I think like, geez, what did I get a law degree for? I'm just, I'm a silkscreen artist making t-shirts. And the short answer to your question is no, I, I probably wouldn't have thought that. But, you know, when I go down to my t-shirt stand on Prince Street and I'm feeling down about, you know, being some kind of like t-shirt artist, and then someone comes along and says, you know, I had the most amazing Thanksgiving last year because of your t-shirt. Because my father was all about, you know, this and this about Afghanistan, and it, it, it yielded this amazing conversation. And then I, I feel like I'm doing something that's contributing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have like a Darfur shirt that, you know, weirdly only kind of like weird UN people tend to buy. And it's just like, and they come by and they're like, oh my God, this is amazing, this is brilliant. And, you know, I often I'm down to myself because I'm, am I wasting my education? No, because I'm doing something that people are really responding to. And again, like we were saying earlier, it's affecting the discourse and what people are talking and thinking about. And it's on a t-shirt. Just so people know, like, where is the best place to, obviously they can buy them here in this beautiful store in Brooklyn. Yeah, Nolan here on Prince Street, uh, on Nolan, Prince and Bowery. We have a t-shirt stand on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays in Soho on Prince Street. And then on our website at dangerousbreed.net. I know they're all probably your favorites, but if you had to, cho you had to choose mm. one. I don't know. I mean, my favorite right now is probably the Walk Like an Egyptian t-shirt, just because of its currentness. Um, the Gay is the New Black is probably another one of my favorites, because it started as a protest placard and then grew out. To, and that one, that one always yields controversy at the mm -hmm. stand, because people don't like the message, they're offended by it, so, which I thrive on. Which, because it creates that conversation that I want to happen. So you're going to show me how this works, right? Yeah. All right. You have your image, which is on the screen in a negative, and where the image is is uh, uh, the ink will pass through where the image is, but not through where their image isn't. Okay. Here's a question so, before you do that. How do you actually make this part? You come up with the art, mm -hmm. and then you get a transparency, mm -hmm. and you print out the transparency, and you put that over a screen that you've painted with this film, mm -hmm. which is this. Right. And the screen, the transparency goes on top of the screen, and it blocks light, because you, you expose the screen, like photography, huh. to light. And where your image was, your art, is blocked. And so then what the photosensitive part gets developed by the light, except where it's blocked from the transparency. And then when you rinse it out, you get the negative of I the screen see. of your design. Very clever. And so then you have a shirt, and okay. then you have a press, and you ink up the screen. We're using what's called discharge right now, yes. which is a type of silkscreen ink that actually doesn't put down any ink. Mm -hmm. I know we get the discharge joke all the time. It takes the color <laughs> out. I'm just going to keep going with you on that. Keep going. It's just going to take the color out of the shirt. Okay. And the beauty of discharge is that it never washes out. I don't know this how many joke times, just keeps I know, on I don't know how many times you can say the word discharge in one segment, but keep going. It's unlimited. So we'll ring a bell, like it'll be like ding. And the key, the key to discharge is that it has to be developed by heat. Oh, okay. And so you have the ink on the screen, you put it down, and you just draw across over your image like that. And then with discharge, it comes out like that, just like that. And then you put it under heat. And it gets developed. All right, so take take the squeegee in your okay. right hand, kind of. Oh, my are you right you lefty hand? or righty? I'm a lefty. Okay, take it in your left hand, and on like a 45 degree angle, like that. Yep, just draw it across, moderate pressure, flip it, and come across it again. So look at this. Thank you so much. I love it so My much. Thank pleasure. you, Tara. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jim, Thank for you. hanging out with us and showing us all these great things. I wish you the best of luck. And, and tell us again where we can buy the shirts. Prince Street, Saturdays, Sundays, Fridays, and on our website at dangerousbreed.net and Tara's store, Nolan, on Prince Street. You got it. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. So next up, I sit down with novelist, pop culture icon, and creator of the juggernaut Sex in the City, Candace Bushnell. And we talk about her new book, Summer in the City, and everything related to Sex in the City, Carrie, Miranda, Charlotte, and Samantha. So here, take a look. 
Hey everyone, I am so thrilled to be sitting today with Candace Bushnell, who in my opinion defined a generation. You may know her as the best-selling author of Sex in the City, and she has a new book out called Summer in the City. And it's all about our favorite gal pal, Carrie Bradshaw, and her BF, Samantha, and the lessons that Carrie learns when she first moves to New York City, and it's a really, really great read, so I can't wait to talk to her all about it. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to me. Congratulations on the book, I loved it. Thanks, Josh, it's great to be here. So tell us a little bit about the book and how you decided to write it initially. People are always wondering if there was like some big grand scheme <laughs> of with course. Sex in the City, you know, <laughs> did you plan the prequels and then the books and then the movies and the TV series? And, and it didn't happen that way. It really happened one step at a time. I wrote the column and the column was a big hit and it was optioned to be a book. And then I had actually a ton of interest from HBO. I think ABC was interested. Several movie companies were interested and it ended up going to... HBO and, and we made the pilot and then we didn't know if there would we would even get a first season So over time as it grew in popularity um, You know we have more seasons and movies and and the time period that summer and the city takes place in is a, a certain time period I've always wanted to write about it's in the early 80s. I came to New York in the very late 70s early 80s and it was just such a big experience. And I thought, well, who better to take on that journey than Carrie Bradshaw? I mean, she's the right age. And, and it's exactly the kinds of things that would happen to her to form that character. When you wrote the book, did you have to go and look at some of the Sex in the City, like, because some of the lore and the history was actually created sort of, you know, later in life, and did you right. go back and say like, oh, well, she sort of did this, and she kind of worked here, and, and sort of built it on that? Uh, no, I actually <laughs> didn't. I actually didn't. No. And, <laughs> and I guess because I, have you know, was a co-producer on Sex and the City and worked with the writers the first two seasons, and then was an executive producer on Lipstick Jungle, and I've, you know, adapted my own books, and it's, it's like apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. TV happens quickly. There are a lot of people involved. You're most likely to pick a location because it's the cheapest location, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, gosh, this is, you know, really where she would be from. It's like, well, that's not available. For me, I just really, I guess I just so much had, like, Carrie's voice and character so much in my head and and then the other characters the the younger versions of those characters just came kind of came out as well and was there a moment where you were like holy shit this is gonna fly i had no experience so i just kind of assumed <laughs> well why shouldn't it be a success <laughs> now you know years later i found out how incredibly rare that mm -hmm. is. I mean, it's almost impossible to get a show on network and, you know, 99% of things fail. And what about how it landed in the pop culture, like, you know, just in terms of its influence? I think what happened was the culture caught up to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was writing about single women and career women all through the 80s. But then in the 90s, I started writing about this particular kind of woman who was in her 30s, and there weren't supposed to be any single women in their 30s. People were suddenly like not ashamed mm -hmm. to be single in their 30s, and Sex in the City made it cool. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, coming to New York in the late 70s, early 80s, sort of on the you know, sort of talent of what we looked at at that generation as feminism, you know, right. in, you know, right. with capital F. I mean, how much of that influenced you in your writing? A huge, a huge amount. Coming to New York in that time, you know, there were all kinds of dirty little secrets that women knew and kind of had to keep quiet about. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, all of my work comes out of, you know, probably a deep, anger and you know really wanting to 
to change the world and to change people's perspective of women. And for me, one way to do that was just to write about women honestly. Well, I think that's a, a really interesting point, especially about coming out of that sort of feminist movement, because then feminism sort of in the late 80s and early 90s gets sort of like a backlash and sort yes. of a bad rep. And I think ultimately one of the things that I found so amazing about Sex in the City was that the mess, the feminist message is very clear, but it's almost the most subversive type of messaging that you can do because it, it, it's coated it with this beautiful yeah. sort of candy coated, fun loving, and yet the message is really strong. It it is, and and I think people do sometimes get distracted by the shoes and the clothes and and. But, you know, again, the reality of a, a TV show is they test everything. Mm -hmm. And in a TV show, you do more of what works. And, and you know, listen, for a, lot of the women, for a lot of women, the show really is about the shoes and the clothes. That's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's great. And, you know, for others, it's about the friendships. And, and I think that... You know, the message in the 80s was when you have a career and you can take care of yourself, the fact of the matter is you really need your girlfriends and your loyalty really has to be towards women as opposed to men because men are going to screw you over. And, you know, even Chris knows as Mr. Big, I mean, what's kind of funny about it is that if for some reason the female audience had not liked Chris Noth as Mr. Big, Carrie would not be with Mr. Big. Right. Mr. Big would have lasted for four episodes. Mm -hmm. And then she would have had to go out with Mr. Bigger. <laughs> well, I think that's important what you're saying because, you know, one of the questions I always ask and ask my friends who are also, you know, Sex and the City devotees and certainly look at those sort of um, archetypes of those women and I say, well, what is the correlation? Why are gay men, you know, finding such comfort and, and such appeal in these four really strong women? And I think right. in a similar way, there was a coming out, if you will, to use right. sort of gay vernacular, of these women. It's like yes. these women are coming out and presenting themselves in a way that we haven't seen in a similar way yes. that men have to come out and present themselves in, in society as well. What I always found was, you know, damn, women are funny and they're especially funny about sex. And, you know, that was some, something that we never really saw before was, you know, was this humor that really keeps you going. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming in and, and taking time out of your busy schedule to sit and talk with me about your book. And your work has absolutely, undoubtedly, without question, influenced a generation, whether that's getting girls to wear a certain type of shoes or drink a Cosmo or, you know, consider having a gay best friend. It, it it's truly has changed the world, so I thank you for that. And remember, the book is Summer in the City, and it's the perfect read for this summer, so I would say put it on the top of your list and you won't be sorry. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. If you've ever watched this show before or its previous incarnation here with Josh and Sarah, you probably know that I love to bake. One of my favorite shows on TV is Amazing Wedding Cakes. So when I got the opportunity to speak with super cool rocker Lori DiTuno of Cake Alchemy, I jumped at the chance. I went down to her studio in Lower Manhattan and she gave me a hands-on lesson on baking. Take a look. One of the great things about my job is that every once in a while I actually get to meet somebody that I have been following for years and years and years. And today is one of those days. I'm sitting with Lori DeTuno, who is a pastry chef, cake tailor, and proprietress of one of the coolest bakeries in town called Cake Alchemy. And you may recognize her from the WeTV show, Amazing Wedding Cakes. And thank you so much for sitting and talking with me today. I'm a huge fan. And on top of it, I actually love to bake. You do? Yeah, I am a... I love to bake. I, my problem with baking is decorating, so we're going to talk about that too. But first, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, how did you begin baking? 
Well, I just used to love to do it for everybody. Did this you? is the one thing that made everybody happy. That's why I bake, you know, desserts more than anything else. And then it's much more artistic, in my opinion, than actual cooking. And how long have you had your own shop? Cake Alchemy, I've been on my own for about three years now. And how did we find you for Amazing Wedding Cakes? They actually just came in and interviewed us. And they really? had interviewed, yeah, a bunch of bakeries. And I think they liked, you know, the dynamic between me and my partner. And, they always say I'm good on camera, so that works. <laughs> I'm like, go with that, you know? So yeah, that's how they found us. Well, you're not the stereotypical pastry chef baker, um, and your cakes certainly aren't, you know, typical of what you would necessarily see in every bakery, which is the thing that I absolutely love about them. Um, so what is your sort of inspiration for your style and for your artistic expression and, and the kind of cakes you make? I like modern design. Like, I love things that look beautiful, and it's not that I don't like the classic, I just like them clean with a focus. I also like edgy rock and roll, you know, so anything really? with skulls, you know, <laughs> like I throw my way. I mean, like blood, it's good, you know, like we do zombie cakes. We do, you know, people come to us for a labyrinth themed cake from the movie. You know, there's all kinds of fun stuff that we get from that, so that's great. Do you find that, like, because your style is very different, then, you know, like in that sort of world of baking um, that you sort of stand out a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm known for being edgy, but also for the sugar work that I do. The sugar work looks like glass, and it's a technique that not a lot of people do, and it's really beautiful. I mean, you can do it into a shape of a fish or a heart. We're known for the bubbles a lot, but it could be anything, roses, and it's a stunning aesthetic that no other medium offers. And what is the most challenging part of what you do? It's really relative to the cake, you know, like, nine, the cake itself, 90% of the time, is easy, unless there's structural challenges. So you have to figure it out. It has to go from here to the venue and be able to sit out for four hours without falling apart. Right. The sugar work is difficult. All that kind of stuff is that I can handle. The most difficult is running the business. <laughs> 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 That's the hardest, I think, of everything, you know. The show must help business. I mean, obviously, like I, that's how I found you, and you know, I, as I said, I, I'm such a huge fan, and, and I watch this show religiously. I mean, does that ever surprise you? Did you ever think like, hey, you know, cake is going to be like the subject nah, of television? I never thought of that, but you know, it's great for us because it educates the consumer, really, to how much work goes into a cake, and then they understand why it costs so much. Because before, it was kind of like, why am I paying for this? And mm -hmm. like, well, we make each petal one by one, <laughs> each bubble one by one. Like, it's really a lot of work, you know. So they then can see that. I love your cakes, and um, you're going to show me a little bit about what you do in the, in the kitchen, right? Yes. All right, let, let's do it. Thanks so much. It's been such a pleasure talking with you, and we'll go see what's going on back there. If, if you could smell what I smell right now, and I have a very bad sense of smell, I should tell you. So <laughs> it must be just crazy good, so I, it smells delicious. So let's see what's going on. Yes, right. let's go. So Ashley's over here kneading up the fondant, and this is the fondant that we use. It's Fantastic. Um, you can, can I it. touch it? Mm -hmm. It's like big dough, but it is. now traditional fondants are made with gum. So if mm -hmm. you think of chewing gum, when it gets wet, it becomes chewy, right? Mm -hmm. So when cakes start to moisten up, it wets the fondant and people then eat it, it becomes chewy. And a lot of reason why people don't like fondant. So these people came up with a specific fondant that doesn't have it. And it tastes really good and it won't skin. And a lot of fondants will skin. You can eat it. Mm. And then what we use to roll is powdered sugar. Then I get my big rolling pin, which is my weapon. Okay. <laughs> so this is heavy. Let me see. This is why this is here. Right? From yeah, cakes. Can... I don't work out my arms at all. And they're wow. more buff than they ever were in my entire life. It's right. from kneading this stuff, which you can try and knead it up first. Okay. And then you have to knead it up to make it soft. So I'm like this. Oh my god. But yeah. See, that's why we all have good arms. That's what you do. You just keep kneading it. I mean that's and then once it's ready, like that soft, then uh, we roll it out. Well, Boy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, it is so hard. So we get that all ready. The cake I already have with a little bit of buttercream on it, but I'm gonna show you how I square okay. it off so it's nice. Now this is buttercream, which is like yummy pounds of deliciousness, yeah. It's cake. Smells like red velvet. Look at that. So this is a bottom wedding cake that we have tomorrow. Voila. And it is actually red velvet, but. This is a wedding cake? It is. You're trusting me with the wedding cake. I just want you all to know that. Well, see, I'm gonna do most of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I just want you all. <laughs> this is nice and cold. Can see? I touch it? Mm -hmm. 
And this is, you want that underneath now, it's gonna set this and it'll make it easier to work with. Now really it already has a good coat, but because it's a white cake, you don't wanna see any red. So you have to go a little bit more with the buttercream on mm -hmm. this. And then see now you hold the turntable. You hold your spatula straight, bring it across. And that's what gives you a nice straight top. Mm. Okay, so also one of the secrets is obviously a turntable. Turn and then I use these, which are bench scrapers, but they give you a nice straight nice. edge so that you can then do this. Kind of like spackling. Now, what I usually do at this point is chill it one more time. We're going to take this as our uh, like flour, you would say, for pastry. Mm -hmm. And you dust it. And then you roll. You just go down. And as you're rolling, you pick it up and move it just to make sure it's not sticking. And this is the other part where the muscle comes in. That and carrying the cakes. You just smooth across, so if you see anything more. Trip on this oh, yeah. So now I can come in and really do a nice clean. It's nice and straight. Yeah. Right? But you can't do that when it's soft. That's what I'm talking about, manipulating the temperature. So now you lift this up and then I'll put the cake under and then we'll put it over. So lift it up. I'll put this under and I'll help you. Yep. And go across. I make sure it's even. Yep. You're good. And let go. We can always pull it. Beautiful. And then you're going to smooth it on the top first. So I do it with my hand first. Yeah. Then you take the smoother. Pushing it down will then, you know, make it want to tear more. But yeah, you just push it up. And then you keep turning the cake. This is exciting, right? I think it's very exciting. I never thought I was going to do this. So then, take this. Now when you cut, I always cut a little bit out. Voila! Nice job. Awesome. See? Now you can go home. Buy some fondant. Try like, to that's what I'm gonna be doing now. Like when people call, I'm like, "What are you doing? I'm yeah, rolling up fondant." They do make machines to do it, but that's no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like rolling it up. That's fun. I always do too. There well, you. thank you so much. Such Great a pleasure, yeah. and um, I wish you all the luck, and I can't wait to see you back on TV. Yeah, you too. All right. Well, that about does it for today. A special thank you to my guests, Jim, Candace, and Lori, and to you for tuning in today. Remember, if you ever want to contact me, just write to me at justjosh at heartv.com, and I'll talk to you again soon. You think I'm going to be able to do that again? Ugh, no. And, and remember, I will always see you again soon. What am I saying? Thanks for watching. Keep, what? All right, sorry. Next up, I sit down with novelist, pop icon co Okay, I've been getting a lot of shit about this section of the show lately. So please, don't write in and tell me that I hate women or that I'm a misogynist or anything like that. that that's not the point. Because I've had girlfriends from day one. But I do have this like minor pet peeve that's been on my nerves lately, and it's this bachelorette thing. Like, going to bars that I frequent and having like these huge bachelorette parties at these gay bars. I don't really understand what the novelty is. I mean, I feel like a zoo animal when these girls show up in their sashes and their penis hats and their penis straws and they're like carrying on and like, like, like it's a circus. I mean, it's kind of insulting, kind of weird and really intrusive because it's not exactly as if they just sort of stand in the corner and quietly carry on themselves. It, they take over these bars. I was in Miami recently and I was in one particular bar and I walked in and literally there must have been four or five different bachelorette parties. I, I was so appalled I had to leave. So what's happening is that the bachelorettes are driving the gays out and it is driving me absolutely insane. I'm just saying. You think I'm going to be able to do that again? <laughs>